Hey there, welcome to Little Guys, the show about little tiny computers that are trying their best. Of course, their best is quite a range, as you're going to be learning over the course of this series. A lot of the machines that I intend to show on here are going to be pretty dang old, like hopefully going back into the early 90s and, and even 80s. But there is, of course, a certain intrigue built into machines that old, right? Their lack of modern capabilities and the, the sort of primitive nature of many of their capabilities is something that a lot of people are interested in seeing. But then there's this in-between period, machines that are too new to be truly, you know, vintage, you know, intrinsically interesting because of how old they are, uh, but they're too old to be useful for any application. And this machine definitely typifies that. It is a truly remarkably banal machine. Uh, once I turn it on, you'll see there is there's absolutely nothing to talk about in terms of its actual capabilities. Everything that I think is interesting about this machine, and this is a theme you're gonna see throughout the series, is about how it's built. And even on the outside, we can see a number of <laughs> intriguing mysteries, like the two ethernet ports that are upside down from the other two ports, huh? Or how about VGA slash serial? Huh? And the case itself is also delightful. Look how blue it is. None bluer. It is the bluest. And of course, this is what you see when you approach this thing. Object. Quite appropriately, the actual name of this thing is the brick system. And I mean, that's almost what I called this series because it's so appropriate. I was just going to call it Bricks. And then I realized that somewhere there must be a television show about drugs by the same name. So this is made apparently by some company called Lex, uh, who are clearly Taiwanese. Uh, and this intrigues me. This says that it has a license for Windows XP Pro for embedded systems. Now, there is a thing called Windows XP Embedded. I don't think that's what this is. I think this is XP Pro for embedded systems. So we need to figure out what that's about. Also, uh, the machine itself, uh, it didn't come with a hard drive, so I didn't get to see what was on it. But this sticker alone, I looked up and I was able to identify what it did. And what it did was both uh, very interesting and kind of disturbing and completely boring. Okay, so I don't know if I can find the page that I found before that it said explicitly what this thing did, but uh, basically, as I understand it, this thing is paired with uh, radio therapy systems. Uh, I think specifically this one went with a gamma knife, uh, which I think is a thing for, for killing brain tumors, basically. And the whole purpose of it, as far as I could tell, is to be what is sometimes called a bastion. That is to say, a machine that sits on somebody's network so that somebody from outside of the network can get a foothold in it, or more specifically, access just one machine on that network. So the multiple ethernet ports on here would have been valuable just at a guess because one of these would have plugged into the uh, surrounding network in the hospital that this was installed in, and it would have been put on like a VLAN, so it only had access to the internet and probably just one remote IP and nothing else. And then the other port would go directly into the radiotherapy machine. And the only purpose of this would be for an agent at the company that maintained the machine to log in remotely with something like, you know, VNC or, or Logman or whatever, uh, just so they could get into the machine and look at its diagnostics, right? So you don't have to send a technician out to the site uh, to look at the device. And based on the information, here on this marketing page, it sounds like they were doing sort of a, a, a predictive maintenance thing where, you know, this thing would pick up a, a notification from the machine that something was wrong uh, and they would log in, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, whenever is convenient uh, and do whatever they needed to do to fix it. Uh, again, without needing to arrange time to go visit the site and whatnot. And having been on the other side of that, on the uh, technician side of it, that is a huge, huge advantage. If you're maintaining stuff and you don't have remote access to it, the cost and time involved in getting somebody out to the site to lay hands on the thing absolutely sucks. When you can just reach in remotely and do stuff, it, it, it's a great thing, okay? It's a fantastic thing, but it does require that you have some sort of foothold in the customer network. So you deploy something like this, the most minimal amount of computer possible to just allow you to get in and act like you have hands directly on the customer's equipment. So predictably, this is very little computer, but it's kind of amazing just how little computer it is and also how little computer it is. This is one of the computers of all time. I mean, <laughs> I have smaller ones and yet somehow this feels like the tiniest computer. I'm curious if I was right about that uh, XP for embedded systems bit. 
Here we go. Windows XP for embedded systems is identical to XP Pro, but it's licensed only for embedded devices. Whereas XP embedded without the for systems part uh, is a componentized version of Windows XP. And that's what I was familiar with. Like basically XP embedded is it's just normal XP, except that you can go in and delete whole chunks of functionality that are normally not optional. They're basically the same thing. It's just about how much of it you can cut out to trim down the machine. So presumably this was a slightly later version. I'm just going to guess that, uh, that Microsoft produced once embedded systems started to get a little more powerful. XP embedded was really important in like 2002, 2003, when an embedded machine had a truly putrid CPU and, and RAM limitations. But um, by the time this thing came out, which was sometime in the mid late 2000s, I believe, uh, that was much less of a constraint. CPUs were getting cheaper and better and RAM was getting a lot cheaper as well. So now let's see if Lex has a page for this brick system. I mean, I'm sure they don't anymore. Oh, would you look at that? They actually do. Naturally, they have a whole series of these things. So, you know, there's one that's clearly in the same chassis, but just quite different. And boy, is that an unholy port arrangement. <laughs> I kind of hate that. Look at the uh, USB port sort of cutting into the, the bottom there. And then this big expanse of empty space. Ugh, that is ugly. But then this one was a tryptophobia, I think it is. It's got sort of the uh, terrifying like lotus seed imagery going on. Uh, but it looks like it's basically the same chassis, just about twice the height. So yeah, that's interesting. Is there a specific model number on here? I don't see one. It might be this BK3743. Let's try that. Uh, it does not appear to be. So yeah, let's just um, dig into it and find out what's inside. Oh, and before I forget to mention it, there is what appears to be a Visa mount pattern on here, which is very funny to me because I'm imagining just sticking it on the end of a monitor arm. Just, just having this on the end of a monitor. It's very fun. Very fun to think about. So all the screws are under feet. So we begin by pulling these off. Naturally, I've lost one of them already. Now, what I love about this chassis is uh, you take out all those screws and then absolutely nothing happens. It does not come apart because you have to take these back two off as well. And I'm really not sure why. It, it seems like it should have held together just fine <laughs> on the four on the bottom, but whatever. <laughs> But with those out, it comes apart quite easily. We'll set that aside for a moment so you can look at the chassis because my God, this is one of my favorite metal parts that I've ever seen. I know that when aluminum gets anodized, they do the whole part at once, but still, when I opened it up and found that it was blue inside and out, it just tickled me pink, or, or I guess, I guess blue. There's just something about it. It's just so damn blue. It, It's adorable. I want to eat it. It's also built like a shit brick house. I mean, that's a quarter inch of aluminum. What is that in metric? 6.35 millimeters. That is a big, big piece of aluminum. So this thing is certainly the brick that it claims to be. I'm kind of curious though, maybe somebody has some insight on this. I'm not sure how this part was made. Obviously this thing was extruded, right? Cause how else would you do it, right? They didn't machine this entire piece out of a huge billet of aluminum, but that would mean they had to come in here and machine down these bosses once they were done. And you can see a dip here where a machine tool came in and, and knocked this boss off. But I'm not sure what size that tool was. It would have to have been like a two to three inch long tool. But given the radius on the little dip that we can see where it cut into the, the sidewall here, it seems like it must have been only like one sixteenth of an inch in diameter, which is a really weird set of dimensions. Although I guess it's possible. It does seem like a, a really exotic tool to use for something like this. But anyway, let's uh, set the metal aside and take a look at the computer because there is far more going on with it. Man, this thing is just sort of a miracle of miniaturization. Not by our modern standards, right? Like this phone here absolutely puts this thing in a grave as far as miniaturization. But it's also kind of a generational leap, if you will. You know how with like silicon manufacturing, there are different processes. And when they go from like 14 nanometer to 12 or whatever, it's this massive technological hurdle that 
when they clear it just opens up all these new avenues for manufacturing, all these new capabilities that we just simply couldn't do before. But then even as, you know, uh, TSMC and other major fabs uh, continue to use that brilliant new technology, a lot of other fabs are still continuing with the older stuff, the much larger processes that produce, you know, less efficient, more you know, primitive parts because they still work and not everyone can afford the, you know, brilliant new technology, right? So this device is sort of an in-between process size, if you will. If you were to buy a consumer motherboard with the same parts on it, it would be much bigger and it would have like visible traces and parts that were spaced out a lot more from one another. And if you were to buy, you know, a really hyper miniaturized device like, you know, a smartphone or some more purpose built uh, x86 micro machine, then you would find uh, much smaller details inside, you know, virtually no visible solder pads for anything, much smaller surface mount components, uh, more layers in the board just so they could get a lot more stuff into a smaller space. So this is sort of a in-between level of miniaturization. And I found that that's where you find a lot of the most interesting details. And then at the same time, that motherboard is housed in a chassis that's made by companies that are targeting sort of a medium niche market. It's not tiny, but it's also nowhere close to the consumer market in scale. So you end up with things like this. This is a piece of stamped sheet metal that really is as simple as it can get. I think, is that aluminum or is that steel? I think that's steel. This is about the least glamorous part that I have ever seen inside of a computing device. You, you simply cannot make a simpler part. It's not possible. And this is actually the hard drive caddy. Let's just take this out and I'll show you what I mean. Suppose we want to put a hard drive in this thing. Well, it plugs into these SATA cables here, but then something has to hold it in place. And it's this plate here. The drive goes right there and you screw it in here, here, and here. Now, what holds down this corner? Nothing. I mean, you don't need anything, right? Like three screws is sufficient. I mean, frankly, two screws is sufficient. And in some applications, one screw. We'll split the difference and use two. The bottom of this plate is just so raw. You know, they made this with like a die cutting process, but they just left the mill scale on it and all the, the scrapes and scratches from handling, you know, putting it on the machine, shoving it into place. That's all just, just on there. And it's not powder coated. It's not plastic coated. They didn't bother to cut out a piece of fish paper and stick it on there. Nothing because it doesn't matter. You know, your drive will be insulated. SSDs were, or at least the ones that they looked at when they designed this thing. So who cares, right? And who cares about holding down the, uh, the dangling corner? They couldn't put a standoff there because uh, there's other parts over there that it would interfere with. So they just said, yeah, screw it. Just uh, make it L-shaped, who cares? There's also nothing to like hold it in place, you know, to locate it. You just have to sort of set it down and get it where it goes and put the screws back in. But we won't bother with that because we've got more disassembly to do. So the thing about this board is it's all about options. It's like that song by Metronomy where he says, uh, mini bar with many choices. And this machine is the mini bar. We've got the SATA hard drive carrier, but then we also have a CF card slot down here. And then underneath that is a spot where you could have soldered on a BGA, uh, like EMMC solid state drive, uh, because this board actually comes in a whole bunch of flavors and configurations, depending on what you want. If we take the single stick of DDR2 RAM out, and by the way, that should give you an idea how old this thing is, there is a model number under here. And that one actually pulls something up. So this is from the Lex system website again, and this is the 31270D industrial SBC family. Uh, SBC is single board computer, by the way. So they've got all these pictures here. Needless to say, uh, this thing is so old, the PDF link goes to uh, 404. But if we go down here and take a look in the list of features, uh, we find out that it has an Atom N270 1.6 gigahertz processor, Intel 945 chipset, which uh, if you know, you know that thing's quite old. But then we get to stuff like this, where it says system memory is onboard DDR2 1 gig, 1X so dim socket, max 2 gig option. Uh, this machine does have the slot, so I guess maybe they, they would have not populated that if you didn't want it there. But you could also have asked them to populate these spots here with RAM chips. So this could have a built-in gig of DDR2, but it doesn't. 
and you could combine that with the extra stick or I guess if you wanted to, you could probably lose the uh, the holder entirely to save, you know, 30 cents. Likewise, it says 1x SATA port, and then there's an option for a second SATA port, which I don't think this one has. Oh yeah, that would be populated right there, it looks like, and that's empty. I wonder if you could put one on there yourself or if it's missing a controller chip. Probably missing a controller chip. Probably would have gone right there. And then there's the network interfaces. Uh, these four chips are each dedicated to one of these ports, and apparently those could have been Intel, uh, but this one got the Realtek, which is interesting because I guess that means Realtek and Intel made chips with compatible pinouts. I suppose that makes sense, but I didn't expect it. But then there's also options in how you can configure it yourself. So for instance, they only have these two USB ports attached to the board, but if you wanted to, you could make a chassis that exposed three more because we've got connectors here here and here for three more USB 2.0 ports. Also, I mentioned how weird it was that this is labeled uh, video slash com. Now I wondered, could it be that they actually put a, a single port in here for the video that you can adapt out to a serial port? Like that would be weird, but you know, as a, a sort of a, um, if the thing won't boot fully and you need to come up and plug in and look at a serial console, maybe you could unplug the monitor and plug in your adapter, something like that. But no, that doesn't appear to be the case at all. It's just that you can install either connector at the factory. So here they've picked the VGA option, but there's a pattern there for a DE9 connector. So they could have put in a serial port instead if you wanted the machine to be headless. And then this port here, I believe, is an option for a second serial port. So if your chassis had room up here, you could have COM2. And you know, it's odd. I thought that maybe uh, with the video installed, that this would be your COM1, but I checked and there doesn't seem to be any continuity between any of these pins. So I guess you can either, so I guess you can either have two COM ports or you can have a VGA and COM2, but never a COM1. Weird stuff. Uh, speaking of weird stuff, yeah, what's going on with these Ethernet jacks? Why are two of them upside down? Well, whenever you see that on any piece of electronics, the answer is always the same. Uh, they're upside down because they had to get parts that fit two different spaces on the board or that came in different configurations. Like on PC motherboards, you'll see things like two USBs and then a USB 3. And then next to it, you'll see four USBs. And they'll be completely different plugs because they had to buy two different parts, right? But in this case, it appears that they just had to get two different parts because they needed extra room on the board over here. So they got shorter ethernet jacks, or, or maybe there's different capabilities between them, I, I don't really know. But the weirdest thing is what they appear to have been making room for were relay positions. Each one of these is a pad for like a double pull, double throw relay. And I have no idea why. There didn't seem to be anything about it on uh, the website. And I wasn't able to get a copy of the data sheet to look at that. So I am utterly baffled as to why this would need relays. The only thing I can think of is that they could have populated it with four dial up modems, but frankly, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, I finally found a copy of the PDF, but unfortunately, it still doesn't explain anything. It shows a version of the board over here that seems to have those relays populated, but there's nothing indicating what they would do. There's no mention on here of any sort of like uh, relay closure, like GPIO sort of feature. I can't see any explanation for it. Yeah, I have no idea what those would be for. That's a total mystery to me. Hey, guess what? I actually have an answer to that one. I could not find a manual for this thing while I was shooting the video, but after the fact, somebody sent me one. And in the list of specs here, it actually explains this feature fairly tersely, but it is there. It says, support one pair LAN bypass function when DC power off. And I could infer from that what it meant, but they also sent me a link to this serve the home article. You might want to look this up yourself. It probably contains more details than I'm going to give here. Uh, but the basic concept is, is very straightforward. Suppose that you have a server on your network and then you want to monitor what that server is doing, or you want to put a firewall in front of it or uh, a proxy, some kind of something that processes the traffic for that one device. So you put your server here, you plug it into LAN two, and then you plug LAN one into the rest of your network or into the internet or whatever. Now this device can just, you know, passively monitor the packets as they flow through it. But what happens if this loses power and all your network interfaces go down? All of a sudden your server is cut off from the rest of the world. Now, 
maybe you want this. If it is a firewall, if it's protecting the server, uh, then you don't want it to just be open to everything. You'd rather the thing be down and inaccessible than be accessible and insecure, but it's all context sensitive. In some applications, this server would be so mission critical that you can't tolerate having it be down no matter what. Or maybe what this is doing just isn't all that important. Maybe it's just monitoring traffic, not actually uh, a filtering it anyway. So if you order this with the relays, then when it loses power, the RG45s on the back actually get physically bridged together internally. So LAN 1 becomes a pass-through straight to LAN 2, as if you took a, a coupler and plugged the cables together. And so when this thing loses power, your server is just instantly swung over to the LAN. And maybe you have to do certain things in the network configuration to make sure this goes smoothly, but it, it's all trivial. It, it, it can all be done. This makes perfect sense, and I somehow had never learned that these existed. Like, it never came up uh, at any time when I was working in network stuff, but uh, I just wasn't working in the right part of the industry to know. So it's really quite a bummer that mine isn't equipped with those because I would have loved to demonstrate them to you. If anybody out there has one that does have the bypass relays or any other uh, little guy like this that has bypass relays, uh, let me know. I'd be interested in uh, doing a quick video about it. Anyway, moving on, in addition to the CF card and the SATA and the option for an onboard SSD, which by the way would have been either 2, 4, or 8 gigs, uh, we also have a mini PCI slot here. But again, they've made some very interesting compromises. Let's just get a mini PCI card to work with here. By the way, there's nowhere on here that you could put uh, like a Wi-Fi antenna, anything like that, but I guess that's up to the chassis designer. However, there is something very intriguing on the spec sheet about this. It's possible this is a typo, but when we look in the part about the PCIe expansion interface, it says PCIe mini card for USB interface. Now, does that mean that they're expecting you to use some sort of USB expansion card in there to activate some of these ports? Probably not. Does it mean there's a version of mini PCIe that just has USB pins in the connector instead of a full actual PCIe lane? I don't think so. Oh, but maybe there is using the USB data lines in a mini PCIe connector. Yeah, apparently some of these pins could be a USB port. Now the hope is that it's still a full PCI port as well, and it just happens to also have the USB lanes. Although in this case, uh, this person seems to be saying that they had an Acer laptop that in fact is set up like that. It only has the USB data lines. So I wonder if I were to put this card in there, if it would actually work. And what type of card is this anyway? Is this Wi-Fi or is this WAN? I didn't even look at it before I pulled it out. Oh shoot, it's got an IMEI. Yeah, I think this is actually a uh, like an LTE or 3G card. Um, but you know, we'll put an OS on here. We'll see if this thing shows up. But first we have to actually install it and there we get to another intriguing compromise. We need to take out this screw to mount the card. Wow, that was a really long retention screw. So we put the card in and then we would screw it down here but not there because there's only one standoff because once again, they just didn't have the room to tag down both corners like they're supposed to. Like there's all this stuff here and they were just like, well, one screw should be enough. And you know, frankly, yes, it probably is. It just means, however, you've got this remarkable sandwich of devices going on here. Let's, uh, let's get a CF card. Okay, so we put the CF card in here, which is actually <laughs> quite awkward. I need to unplug the uh, SATA plug first. Oh, you know what? That's cute. They put a little rubber foot under the cable so that uh, this would be supported. Th this has always been a complaint with me that SATA cables are really poorly supported and they actually bothered to buffer it. That is adorable. All right, there we go. Okay, CF card in. Then we plug our SATA cable back in. Then we install our mini PCI card. And then we would plug in our hard drive and lay that on top like that and look <laughs> at how things are stacked here everything is so close together but of course it would be right because it's just a little guy it has exactly as much room as he needs and not a single millimeter more 
But anyway, let's uh, actually take it apart further because the most interesting thing about this is how this chassis was put together. Now, as far as I can tell, Lex made both the board and the chassis, but I still don't think that the designers of the board were exactly expecting that it would be used in, in precisely this way. So to get this apart, we have to take out a lot of screws. So we begin with two back here. And then we have to pull these standoffs. And then this one in the back here is delightful because for some reason it has some washers on it. Not sure why those were needed there and nowhere else. And then there's one more screw that's hiding up here. I missed that for quite a while when I first dismantled this thing. And, you know, I obviously just missed it again. <laughs> all right, so that's all the screws out and... Um, mm, 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 no, nothing, nothing doing. There really is nothing left that's going through this board into the base holding it on. What's actually happening is these screws here are holding it down, but not for the reason you'd think. They don't go into more standoffs. Those are just going into uh, these spring-loaded screws that you see being used on CPU heat sinks, because that's exactly what this is. There is a heat sink down there, or rather a heat conductor, just like we've seen before on these things. Uh, rather than having radiating fins, these are just blocks of aluminum whose job it is to get the heat from the parts on the board up to the chassis so it can be dissipated. This machine is interesting, by the way, because it has no radiator fins anywhere. The sole idea with the thermal solution is just get the heat into these big hunks of aluminum, and there'll just be so little of it that it will very slowly dissipate into the environment and it'll just never get hot enough to need convection. But anyway, these are not attached to the chassis in any way. I think you can see that there. They're just wiggling, but this thing still won't come out until we take off these screws on top. And they look like standoffs themselves, but they actually, well, they sort of are. They're pass-through standoffs, if you will. I don't know what else to call them. You see, they're like couplers. They have a thread on top, and then they have a different thread on the bottom, along with this little uh, nipple area that goes through the board to keep it centered. It's very interesting. Uh, but in the end, we're left with this screw just sort of sticking through the board loosely. So let's get the other ones off. And now the board will lift out, but it, there's quite a bit of resistance still. And you'll see why in a moment. Yeah, it was the thermal compound, which is holding these chips on the board down to the sinks. And then the sinks, in turn, have been stuck to the chassis with another thermal pad. So if I had not taken these uh, standoffs off, and if I just levered this thing out of there, well, I think I would have broken the board in half or snapped the chips off uh, with the amount of force I would have had to apply. But even if that didn't happen, I would still destroy these thermal pads down here and have to replace them. And that's assuming they're not like a thermal epoxy, because that really uh, does not want to go anywhere. And I, I don't want to screw it up by ripping it off. So yeah, this, this was their solution. This is the actual board. I don't know what the intended thermal design is supposed to be, but given that Lex made this chassis, maybe this indeed is how you're supposed to do it. And I mean, it makes sense. There's nothing really wrong with it per se. It's just very strange and unexpected. I mean, what reason would you have to get at the bottom of the board after the thing's assembled? There's nothing you can do down here. Uh, all the parts we have are just uh, the Intel Atom chip itself, what I believe is the chipset, although I can't uh, find a number on it. This is the I.O. controller, which I think is sort of like um, sort of like a Southbridge, I want to say. Uh, this here is a Super I.O. chip. Uh, this guy here is a multi-clock source generator, and then there's just other little bits and pieces of glue on here. Nothing you need to care about, nothing you need to touch. It's all you know, completely internal, right? All the interesting stuff is on the other side as far as what you're ever going to lay hands on. And also, presumably, this thermal paste is not supposed to be that sticky. I think it's just, you know, surface tension keeping it from popping off. But uh, boy, howdy, does it do a good job. That seems like nice, fresh stuff, which is interesting because this machine appears to be very, very old. If we look up that CPU, that is an Atom N270, products formerly Diamondville. Uh, and it was first made in quarter two, 2008. So this thing has some years on it. That is a single core 1.6 gigahertz processor. Woo -hoo! 
2.5 watt TDP. Does it support virtualization? <laughs> Where? Oh, this is a 32-bit machine. That that hadn't even clicked with me. Yeah, this isn't even 64-bit. Yeah, I don't even see a memory limitation on there. So I think maybe the, uh, uh, what is this? The Northbridge probably is responsible for the memory interface. I can't remember how these things work. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Anyway, I just thought this was a very quirky way to put a computer together. So let's put this computer back together. Oh, that's the power switch, by the way. It just goes to a, a little momentary uh, rocker on the front. You could replace that with anything. By the way, some of these ports on here I have not been able to fully identify, but this one here is labeled uh, CFPC, which I assume is front panel connector. So probably you could actually have like a power light and hard drive light and, and all that nonsense. But uh, this one actually doesn't. It has this built-in power LED and that's it. Likewise, I'm not sure what this connector here or here does, but again, probably just more options for how to do the front panel. There's also, wow, look at that. There's a fan header. What on here could possibly need a fan? I have no idea. But anyway, let's button this thing back up and we'll turn it on. It's very polite of these screws to stay right where you left them. It would be really irritating if you had to hold these in place with a pair of pliers uh, while you put the uh, standoffs back on. Although you do have to do that in order to get them tightened down. And I did have to do that in order to get them broken loose in the first place. Uh, it would be a hell of a lot harder if these things just fell out of place. And like they could have been just the tiniest bit shorter and that would have happened. But instead, they're exactly the right length. That probably wasn't an accident. Oh, one more thing I'll comment on is the use of a CR2032 battery. There are so many machines, uh, tiny machines and laptops and industrial systems that I've seen where they used something else, you know, like a 2016 or a soldered on battery or uh, a battery in a little heat shrink package with a proprietary plug on it. Like, man, come on. There's no excuse. There's, I have never seen a machine that could not have fit a 2032 holder in it if they had just cared enough. You can get those upright ones for Christ's sake. Like there's always the option. Don't, don't put some weird proprietary RTC battery in your computer. Come on. That's just mean spirited. It's actually kind of amazing to me uh, as a, you know, retro computer person, just how many machines are rendered essentially useless by the inability to ever replace the battery. I mean, of course, there's always options, right? You know, you can always finagle something, but it's such a pain in the ass. And I mean, there are a couple cases where you really can't finagle anything. Uh, like, for instance, the uh, Titanium Power Book uh, with, the, I think, the G4 processor, there is a version of that where the PRAM battery is a hyper proprietary module that contains an absolutely bizarre rechargeable lithium that nobody can get anymore. So those machines are functionally landfill fodder because you will never be able to get the PRAM battery working. You can't just stick something in there because there's a charging circuit that's going to try and charge it. So if you put something in there that's not intended for it, uh, it'll blow it up. Like it's just completely unnecessary complexity. They didn't need to do it. It serves no purpose. And all those machines have turned into pumpkins as a result. It is so frustrating. And wouldn't you know I own one of them? I own two of them actually, but one only has the uh, kind of stupid battery, the one that takes four separate rechargeable coin cells that you have to manufacture into. I'm gonna stop complaining and finish putting this together before I say something unkind. So the last part is the SATA carrier. Uh, uh oh. Um, what were those from? I don't remember taking these out. What were these? Ah, shit. I have no memory of taking these screws out. Maybe they were from a different project and they were just in the holder? Oh, they're from the laptop that had the Wi Fi card in it. Oh, now I remember. Okay. Memory of a damn goldfish over here. One little note, by the way, I just realized this. These Visa mount holes aren't capped on the back. So if you're mounting this thing and you put in really long screws, they will go right through and short against the back of the motherboard. And that's if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, you like grind some traces out. So uh, yeah, don't, don't over penetrate there. So that's our completed package. I mean, we don't necessarily need all these parts, but I do wish that I had the version that had the EMMC on it. So I could have the EMMC and the CF card and the SATA card, and then maybe uh, some sort of storage device in the mini PCI if one existed. I mean, it can always get more ridiculous, right?
and I'm going to put the plugs back in the back, but not on the bottom, because I hate the thing rocking back and forth. Well, what if you just found the one that you lost? Yeah, well, what if I won a million dollars? We'll need a display. And of course, we'll be using VGA, the universal language of industrial computers. Oh, and this guy wants 12 volts, but as is typical for devices like this, it doesn't actually say how much current it wants. Uh, but that CPU is rated at two and a half watts and the whole rest of the machine, da 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 da, an amp is fine. 12 volts, one and a half amps. That'll do, pig. Uh, well, <laughs> not if the center plug doesn't fit. Second verse different than the first. 12 volts, 1.67 amps. Normal plug. Mm bah. Excellent. Let's get a different worst keyboard I own. Oh, it's on already. Uh, I don't want you on yet. All right, let's try this again. There we go. Oh, system initializing. Please wait. Oh, okay. So they put a little custom uh, BIOS splash screen on there. And of course, there's no boot medium. So I think it just goes into a coma. Let's see if we can get into the BIOS. There we go. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, that's got some years on it, doesn't it? These ancient award BIOSes are, are so disappointing because they just, they don't have several of the modern capabilities that appear just a couple years later. Well, actually, I mean, even for, for 2008, I think this was kind of outdated, but when you got a couple years later, then pretty much every machine had a BIOS that would let you do things like uh, jump in here and choose from a boot device out of a menu uh, or, or at least reorganize your boot devices. Whereas this one, yeah, it's just going to be this sort of thing where it lists every possible kind of device. But then, like, for instance, if you have multiple USB boot devices plugged in, you can't select between them or anything. And hard disk is just, you know, all hard disks. It's it's an ancient, like, late 80s way of doing things. Eh, you know what? It actually does have the uh, hard disk boot priority menu, so I'm, I'm full of shit. But what else is new? Well, anyway, it can clearly see both our CF card and our Intel SSD. I definitely want to install on that CF card. And let's just make sure we're set to USB CD-ROM and then hard disk. And we can probably put XP on this thing. Are there any interesting features in here? Probably not so much. I don't know. It, it, uh, this particular BIOS is just ancient. Okay, if you were having trouble making stuff out on the monitor, it's because the brightness was turned way down. You weren't missing anything. Don't worry about it. And of course, in the frequency voltage control, you absolutely cannot overclock this thing. So yeah, that's exactly what we'd expect. Uh, let me get some install media and we'll see if we can install some media. So I'm gonna try putting XP Pro on here off of a normal retail disc because in theory, that license on the bottom should be for normal XP Pro. Even though it says embedded, uh, everything says that they are binary identical. So hopefully that, that key should work. I mean, I have options if I don't want to use a key, but that's not the point. I'm just really curious whether that really is just completely ordinary XP. So to this end, I'm going to be using a device called the uh, IODD, or I call it the IOD ST400. I have not seen many people talk about these, and they're kind of miraculous. Uh, there's a good chance this machine would not boot off of a USB flash drive or not reliably, or it would be hanky. And at any rate, getting XP to install off of a flash drive is a, a kind of an unpleasant process. It could be flaky at best. Uh, but this thing is actually a CD-ROM emulator, which is to say it literally appears to the system to be a CD-ROM drive connected via USB. As far as this computer is concerned, this is a spinning disk. It's got an SSD in there. I've got a whole bunch of ISOs on here and I just pick whichever one I want. All right, and now we should be able to boot off that. The blinky light indicates it's being pulled. All right, and there it is, it's loading. I'm gonna do a video about this thing eventually, I think, because it is incredibly handy. The fact that it's not a flash drive makes it much more compatible with machines like this. What I will say though, is that uh, this thing does not operate at full USB speeds. It simulates a CD-ROM at realistic speeds, as far as I can tell. So uh, this is probably gonna install at the equivalent of like 48X or 52X. All right, and it detected my CF card. Oh, huh, it doesn't like the partition for some reason. Um, I try to repartition the disk, but then it just says the device does not contain a Windows XP compatible partition, huh? Oh, that's what's going on. Both these drives are showing up with the same identifier. Look at that. Disk zero, ID zero, bus zero on a tappy. 
disk zero, ID zero, bus zero on a tappy. I noticed this because when I pick this partition here, it says that it's trying to write them to 114,000 meg disk, which is actually the SSD. Oh, that is weird. I guess I'll kill that drive in the BIOS and try again. Now we're installing. Terrific. All right, that took a really long time. I have not seen XP take that long to install in years. Uh, so let's try this CD key. The CD key is not valid. Yeah, who's surprised? Yeah, I just used a random one off the internet and it worked fine. So there must be another edition, uh, like a slightly different role of the ISO that's required for that to work. Or maybe it only works with like the SP3 retail release or an OEM release. It's probably the OEM release. That's probably where I screwed up now that I think about it. I guess I'll just let somebody else be the person who figures out the answer to this question. Well, that's fun. Uh, it finally finished installing, took quite a while. And the first thing that happens is I get an error saying I have no paging file, but like I just installed, why would it not have virtual memory enabled? That's, uh, hmm, that's concerning. Let's go take a look. There was a problem that occurred with your paging file configuration when you started your computer. Okay, what was it? Uh, okay. System managed paging file size is nothing. Uh, what if we try setting one? Okay, it says it'll set it. Let's see if that worked. Notice that it's beeping, by the way, instead of uh, emitting noises, because of course, well, we're using VGA instead of HDMI or DisplayPort, so we wouldn't be able to hear the sound card, but also uh, there's no sound output on this thing whatsoever. It just clicked with me. It has an onboard Realtek sound chip, but there's no actual headphone jack anywhere. There's a knockout here that looks like they could have put a headphone jack in there, but of course nobody bothered because why would you ever want one in this application, right? Presumably the uh, front panel header connector in there could be used to break out the audio if you really wanted to, just nobody bothered for obvious reasons. Okay, same error. So it refused to set a paging file even though I manually configured it. Let's take a look at the drive itself. Oh, well, that would do it. Okay, let me explain what's going on here real quick. So uh, this is the IOD and this is also the IOD. Uh, it exposes a virtual uh, like USB drive uh, so you can drop ISOs onto it and whatnot. So let me just unplug that so as not to confuse matters. All right, and that just leaves us with the C drive which shows up as a removable disc. And this is very important. I think I see exactly what happened here. Let me just look this up and confirm it real quick. Yep. Yep, that's the problem. All right, let me explain. That CF card that I put in there was really fast and really big, but not because it was meant for this purpose. It was intended to be used in like a digital camera. So it has a bit set that says, hi, I am a removable disc. So that when you plug it into an ATA interface or, or into a, um, a USB adapter, Windows will see it as a removable drive and it won't do disk caching and it'll know to expose the eject icon so that you can safely remove the device without corrupting anything. The problem is that Windows XP is unwilling to put a swap file on a removable drive for what should be obvious reasons, right? It doesn't know whether that's just like a USB thumb drive here. And if it put a swap file there and you unplugged it, then all of a sudden the memory for a whole bunch of running apps and maybe part of the OS would evaporate and there'd be no way to get it back. So this is a, a reasonable thing to do. And it's only gone wrong because I've done something I'm not supposed to do. For this sort of application, you're supposed to get something like this. This is a Western Digital Silicon drive. It's no different as far as I know from the drive that I put in there. It might be made with like slightly higher reliability flash or something like that. But the important thing is that it has that removable drive bit cleared. So when you install this through like a, a CF to IDE adapter, Windows will see it as a normal fixed disk. And that's exactly what I've done here. That uh, connector on the board probably goes straight into a totally normal IDE disk interface. And if I could go in and modify that drive to remove that flag, then I could fix this problem. And there might be a way to do that, but you know what? It's not worth it. I don't even really need to get this machine working. I only put Windows on here for two reasons. One, to see if that CD key worked. It didn't, but I think that's my fault. And two, I wanted to find out whether that mini PCIe slot was actually wired up. So let's take a look at device manager. <laughs> that sure is a lot of driverless devices. <laughs> the XP experience. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, yeah, there's our HP mobile broadband module that I pulled out of that laptop. So clearly the PCIe slot is actually hooked up. Hooray!
Okay, I have incredibly funny news about the comment that I just made. Uh, apparently, a lot of WAN cards are actually USB. So even though they're on many PCIe carriers, they actually use only the USB lines. I don't know if that's true for this particular one. I was not able to find any info on that particular model. Uh, but you can go to Amazon and just buy adapters that just generically say WAN to USB. So the fact those exist tells me that, uh, yeah, probably most of these are USB. Yeah, I specifically grabbed the least useful device for testing this. The manual says support mini card for USB interface and doesn't make any mention of PCI Express. So yeah, I, I strongly suspect that that's not really a PCIe slot. It's just a USB port with you know, the, the card edge connector on it. Somehow I never learned about this in all my years of doing laptop repair and whatnot. So the more you know, I guess. And with that, I think we're done. That's pretty much all I wanted out of this thing. Like I said before in this series, the capabilities of these machines uh, are really not all that important to me. Like they're, they're just PCs, right? There's nothing I could do with this that would be the least bit interesting. It's just a Windows XP computer. I could run Windows XP software on it, right? Which is almost everything. And it has no special hardware features. There's no 3D accelerator. There's no funky serial ports. There's no nothing. It's, it's an incredibly bare bones PC. It just has four ethernet ports. And what is there to see about that, right? I would plug them in. It would get an IP address. Wow. I don't even know if I could set up Nick teaming on XP or if these ones support it. It doesn't matter. The, the point is the only thing I really cared about with this device and probably a lot of other devices in this series is the physical chassis and the board itself. And I think that was more than interesting enough for my tastes. And I hope it was for you too, because uh, I have a whole lot more episodes just like this planned. There are so many of these things out there and I have like four or five more already. And uh, that's pretty much the depth of analysis I'd like to do on every one of them. So if you're into that, uh, then maybe subscribe to my channel so you'll see more of these videos when they come out and I'll, I'll know you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but if you want to make sure that those videos get made, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing. Uh, they're the only reason any of this is possible. Uh, this is my full-time job, so, you know, without my patrons, I wouldn't be able to buy gas or groceries or pay rent or anything like that. But I certainly wouldn't be able to go out and pick up weird little bricks like this. Uh, this is the sort of thing where when you find it, you just have to grab it. You can't really go out and, uh, you know, <laughs> locate it on eBay directly. You just have to like wander around, go to computer stores, uh, you know, scrounge around on eBay with like random search terms. And if you happen to see something interesting, you just grab it. And my patrons give me the budget to do that. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them uh, for giving me a blank check to just come up with uh, stuff that I hope entertains them. And I hope it's been entertaining. I want to thank all my patrons again for making this possible. Thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching.